Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 3 in the ongoing analysis of the John Bonet Ramsey timeline and we're going to concentrate in this episode more on a particular character and we're sort of going to move forwards and backwards in time in terms of this particular person. Now obviously you might be wondering well you know aren't we dealing with the timeline step by step between the 10th and the 20th there are odd days where we don't exactly know what happened on those days from the 20th onwards it's sort of a day by day we, we do know exactly what happened on those days so but it is important again contextually to get a sense of who John Bonet was, what happened, who are the people involved, and from people that you, you may not be all that familiar with. And although I think some of you may know about Judith Phillips, there's probably something in this episode that is going to be news to you. Now you may have seen Judith Phillips in, I think it was the case of John Bonet. I think it was the second episode, the third episode was eventually sort of cold when there was sort of like a legal, seemed like legal action was going to be taken. But anyway, Judith Phillips did appear in that. I wonder if you can remember what she said in that, in that episode. I think it was episode two. So in this episode, we're going to talk about Judith Phillips in 1997, so after the fact, we're going to talk about Judith Phillips also so in October 1997, and then we're going to go a bit closer to probably around about February 1997, and then we're going to go into sort of a little bit earlier, sort of in 1996, okay? So... It's still dealing with a timeline, but it's dealing with it in a kind of a different way. Bear in mind, this is 24 years later, and we are looking at this case through like a rear view window. And all we're trying to do is get a richer picture than has been sketched in documentaries and the news media up until, up until this point. Worth playing for. Okay, so if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So what I want you guys to look out for, especially those of you who are familiar with the Chris Watts case, very familiar with the Chris Watts case, I want you to obviously concentrate on what we are dealing with in this episode. Think of it as a potential mirror for the Watts case. So what I'm saying is, we're going to be exploring a couple of elements in this episode that I want you to keep an open mind. You know, is there a parallel in the Watts case, right? This episode is dealing with pictures, photographs, appearances. On paper, there's not much that is similar between the Watts case and the, the Ramsey case. You could say they both had big houses, right? And there were a lot of photos taken of the family and that they seemed like the perfect family. But beyond that, it's not that similar. The Ramses were very wealthy, very, very wealthy, and the Watts family were not at all. In fact, they were, fa they were definitely facing their second bankruptcy. I'm actually going to be doing an episode on the Watts family, doing a what if, like what if the murders didn't happen when they happened. And... That might be, I think, quite interesting in terms of this whole idea of time travel. So anyway, coming back to the Ramses and Judith Phillips, on October 6, 1997, People magazine did an article. It was actually titled Mom and Dad Under Suspicion. So less than a year after the events, you had sort of publications leading with, with that story, right? That the Ramsey parents were under suspicion. And in that particular article, there was a kind of a snippet, a, a little bit of information about Judith Phillips, the former photographer and friend of, so photographer of John Bonet, but kind of of the Ramsey family and friend of Patsy. Okay. Now I'm going to refer in a moment to 
how they met, how their paths crossed. Before we get to that, let's just look at what was going on in October 1997. Now, bear in mind, this is when they were still kind of under the umbrella of suspicion, right? And the article kind of goes on to say, less stalwart acquaintances are ostracized. That's kind of just another way of saying that, that, you know, in the same way that people can be blocked now on social media, um, in those days, you know, 23, 24 years ago, you sort of ostracized someone, you didn't talk to them, just in terms of your social network. And so what is being implied here is that Judith Phillips wasn't very loyal. And we're going to look at why they thought that was the case. So in the article, they talk about Judith Phillips being a bolder photographer who's known the Ramses for 13 years. That's, that's, that's a long time. You know, that is beyond four years longer than, than Burke was alive. So that's quite a long time. Anyway, she conducted photo shoots of John Bonet and Patsy. I think she actually also took the photos of Patsy when she had cancer. So she's quite a close friend, someone who you want, you feel comfortable being vulnerable with. Anyway, Judith says in the article, I've met a lot of families in the South where they just sweep all the bad stuff under the rug and they create this perfect outward image. Patsy was a Miss America contestant. And image building is the whole thing in the Miss America contest, contest. She does it well. So, you know, in the previous episode, we spoke about pageantry. And it's one thing to know what pageantry is in broad strokes. But here you have a photographer who knew Patsy personally. And she's talking about it in a kind of a totally different way. She's talking about almost like a the personality of some people in the south where they you know it's sunny side up being positive sweeping the bad stuff under the rug and trying to create a perfect outward image right and think about that again like compared to the the watts family sweeping bad stuff under the rug creating a perfect outward image where does that get you what happens in a situation like that creating a fairy tale when to cover over a nightmare and so when something like that is happening now you might say what is the nightmare in the ramsey family well there were a couple of things there was patsy's cancer there was the death of john ramsey's eldest daughter beth in a car accident and that's just kind of i won't say the tip of the iceberg but but there were there were things like that that were going on that weren't great you could also say an unhappy marriage is a nightmare and you cover that over by giving this appearance of perfection you could say that was happening in the watts family maybe it was happening in the ramsey family what i do think is interesting is this whole idea of image building and a crime now in the watts case it wasn't so much Chris Watts tasked with image building, it was his wife, but he was certainly aware of how she was doing it, how she was influencing people, how she was promoting her stories. So wasn't it just natural for him after he committed the crime to do the same thing, to tell stories and try and wriggle out of accountability? In the Ramsey case, think about just that statement where you just sweep all the bad stuff under the rug and think about the John Bonnet Ramsey case. Hasn't bad stuff been swept under the rug? And then you might say, what is the bad stuff? It's a good question. What is the bad stuff in the Ramsey case? And I think one of the best ports of call to look into stuff like that are from the housekeepers. And there were a couple. But the other thing is, Patsy being a Miss America, image building is the whole thing in the Miss America contest. So in the same way that Patsy knew how to build her own image, knew how to build the image of her child in his pageants. What about preserving your image when something happens, like a scandal, like a, you know, like what happened to John Bonet? What, what do you do when that happens? And I think the answer was simple image building. How do you recover your reputation? How do you make sure that you preserve your treasure? And we know that they went on CNN, I think it was, was New Year's Day, right? It was kind of ill-advised, but that was all about presenting an outward image, the appropriate outward image. 
uh, it was about image building, and I think it was to some extent about preserving John Ramsey's business. You know, making sure that things don't run away, that that he might lose his business. Another quote from that article, and I'm, I'm quoting from a really excellent resource here, a candyrose.com, in their section about Judith Phillips. Outwardly, by this time, the Ramsey's relationship appeared to have cooled. So this is obviously Judith Phillips's impression. She says, early on, the Ramses were very touchy-feely, but in Boulder, I didn't see them do a lot of physical touching and hugging. So the photographer is kind of saying in October that she's speculating that maybe there were marital issues. And now, once again, you've got to kind of ask the question from the children's perspective. And again, think about the watch children. How do children perceive their parents individually and as a couple? when they have kind of marital issues, meaning can children feel neglected? Can children feel that they're not getting the attention they need when their parents are straying from one another and the attention is sort of diverted to perhaps someone else or something else or both? And I don't think that's a very difficult question to answer. When anyone is distracted... I mean, I'm distracted right now recording this video. My puppy wants to go for a walk. He's feeling neglected. I wouldn't say I'm distracted. This is some work that I'm doing. But the point being, when you are not paying attention to a young person regularly, they're going to feel neglected. And then what happens when that happens? What happens when the neglect reaches a certain level? And I think the answer is something happens. If we go just a little bit further forward in time to February of 2000, she did a interview with Mary McCardy, is it Mary McCardle Suma? And she, she was asked something about John Bernays' hair being dyed. Now, bear in mind, this is as a six-year-old. So she's asked, were you shocked about this, her, being, her hair being dyed? And Judith answers, yes, I was shocked. And I asked Patsy, you know, what did you do to John Bonet's hair? You didn't dye it, did you? And Patsy said, no, no, no. It was a, the hot summer sun in Charlevoix that dyed her hair. And she's asked, but, but wasn't it obviously bleached? And Judith laughs and says, yes, it was obviously bleached. It was obviously bleached. I thought, how stupid do you think I am? I didn't respond, but I thought, I said, oh, isn't that interesting? So... That is just a interesting little anecdote where you kind of have the photographer, a woman, aware that, that John Bonnet's hair has been dyed. It's clear. And you can actually see in the um, Christmas party of the 23rd, I'm not going to put the picture up just yet, but her hair is very light. It's, it's, a, it's almost like a white color very very light color and this is in the middle of winter of course and children's hair can tend to fluctuate in color but what is interesting here is is the scenario where the photographer seems to believe that Patsy's not being completely honest and even though she's quite sure that Patsy's not being completely honest she doesn't really say anything just in a general way think about dyeing hair and beauty queens do you think that that is anathema to beauty queens do you think beauty queens themselves would dye their hair? Do you think beauty queens would dye their children's hair if they appear in pageants? Now, what's quite interesting, just a parallel with the Watts case, is just that Shanann's mother was a hairdresser, I think, and Shanann's best friend was an ex-hairdresser, and there was quite a lot of hair dyeing going on as well, you know, in that story. Anyway, I'm going to go back, take you back in time now. And we're going into Lauren Schiller's book, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town. Uh, we're on page 241. And what is quite interesting here is it's just giving a little bit of a description of how John knew the Phillips family. He met Robert Phillips, his Boulder estate attorney. Um, so that's how they knew one another. Um, Judith's husband was an attorney who was 
you know, uh, um, John Ramsey was his, a client of his. Um, and also their child, they had a, a daughter. Their, da their daughter play was sort of Burke's age. And so that was another thing that they sort of had in common. So I think it was in February 1997 that they saw each other. And Judith said that Patsy appeared to be heavily medicated. And during this encounter in February, Patsy started crying on Judith's shoulders. At this point, they were still friends. And Patsy said to Judith, if only I had woken up, if only I'd, I woke up, why didn't I wake up? And what do you think that that refers to when Patsy said that? And this is obviously assuming that this account is accurate. Um, if Patsy did say that, what, what do you think she could have meant? If, if only I'd woken up. I would suggest that, that when John Bonet screamed, her mother didn't hear her and and that is what she's upset about and i do think john benet screamed someone did say they heard a child scream in the middle of the night a neighbor we'll, we'll deal with that on in the events dealing with december 25th so the, it does seem like there clearly was a scream the issue is for patsy you know why didn't she wake up i think one of the questions you can then ask is where was John Bonnet assaulted and I think you can answer it in two ways the one is if if John Bonnet was far enough away in other words perhaps in the basement then her mother wouldn't easily have heard the scream right on the other hand if Patsy was sedated in some way perhaps she'd had a couple of um, glasses of wine or whatever it was Christmas Day after all and they just returned from a party. It's possible that she was more kind of sleepy and difficult to rouse than she would otherwise have been, right? And that may be why she didn't wake up. In other words, the scream may not have been inaudible. It may have been a case that she wasn't she wasn't awake. She may have been asleep but, you know, in a in a very deep sleep for a variety of different reasons. I'm I'm speculating of course. So I think something else that's worth mentioning is that at this point in February, the Ramses were living with the Steins. Burke was friends with Doug Stein and Patsy was friends with Susan Stein and John Ramsey, I think, employed the Mr. Stein. I can't quite remember what his name was. And anyway, the, the Steins lived just around the corner from the Phillips family, so very close to them, um, I think she says that, yes, that, that the Steins were just around the corner from her own home. And so in time that the Steins would emerge as sort of stalwart uh, allies, friends of the Ramses, so going forward after the event, whereas Judith Phillips would later be ostracized. And you might ask why. I think one of the reasons why, and this is my opinion, is because I think Judith Phillips sold the photos that she'd taken of John Bonet or the family. It was either that she sold them or that someone got hold of them. But basically, I don't think the Ramses were very happy that this case became as the public spectacle that it became. I think they were quite upset about being under the spotlight to the extent that they were. And, and a big reason for this was these photos. And... You know, one of the extraordinary things about the John Bonnet Ramsey case is the amount of photos we've got of this little girl. If you compare it to even the photos of the Watts children, you know, these. this is a girl who's made up, who looks like a princess. And just when you look at her face, you, you can't believe that what happened to her happened to her. So you can't kind of reconcile the pageantry, the, you know, this little princess with the, the nightmare that actually played out. Just, it, it, they seem at odds with one another. And so in the same way with the Watts family where you kind of had grudges and resentments, you know, in terms of certain people, that also manifested 
in the Ramsey circle. You had people who were no longer allowed in the kind of inner circle. And I think the whites were eventually excluded from that circle. And Judith Phillips was excluded from that circle. But the Steins were very much allies with the Ramsey family. So just a final thing to mention. Judith was infuriated. This is quoting from Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, page 242. She was infuriated when Patsy said in a CNN interview, hold your babies close to you because there's a killer out there. And this is because her daughter, Lindsay, couldn't sleep in her bedroom for six weeks after she heard Patsy say that on TV. And uh, so Judith was very upset about that. And Judith was certain that John and Patsy knew more about John Bonet's death than they were saying. She couldn't imagine Patsy murdering John Bonet, but she could imagine Patsy being involved in a cover-up. And that's just really Judith's opinion based on knowing Patsy, is that she could imagine Patsy... Think, just think about what a, a pageant is. It's kind of covering up the faults and flaws in a person, dressing them up, you know, turning them into something else, making them appear different. Now think about that pageantry and something like a crime scene. Just think about the pageantry of transforming a person's appearance and what they can do on a stage. You know, it's a little girl who wants to play in the mud and draw on her arms and, and be silly and whatever, but as soon as they're on stage, it's a polished performance. It is saying certain things, doing certain things, move, moving in a choreographed way to an audience. And then ask yourself, can that translate the, the stage of a, of a pageant? Can that translate to the stage of a, of a house, of a, but in terms of a crime scene? What do you think? So I'm not going to take it further than that. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. Like, share, leave a comment. And I'll see you guys next time.